Welcome. We are going to be doing all of first semester computer science. We're going to go over all of the basics of C++ today in one two hour session. So uh, strap in, get ready, um, and we're going to go from basically hello world very quickly. Um, this is really not for people that have never programmed before. It's for people that have kind of programmed in C++ and kind of need a reminder. And we're going to get into like some of the nooks and crannies of C++ that we did not in CSI 40 in first semester computer science. So in the previous class, we actually went over quite a few things that nobody had seen before. So you'll feel hungry again another hour. That's true, I just had some oatmeal. So um, let's do this. So then main.cc and let's just go ahead and delete this, I guess. I guess we'll just start from, start from scratch. Okay, so in, this as well. So in computer science, this is this is about it. There's only these things you need to learn. And the hard thing is putting them all together. Like for the Zeta assignment, if you guys are working on that, there's like a loop calling a function, which calls a loop, which calls a function, you know, and like structuring these things together and putting the pieces together to solve a problem. That's actually the hard part of computer science. The actual mechanics of like programming, like how do I make a function? How do I make a variable? That's all the kind of stuff that you should have down pat by, um, yeah, theoretically by the end of CSI 40, really by the end of CSI 41. Like I said, CSI 41 is the last learn to program class we have. After that, you're kind of you're kind of expected to know how to program. Okay, so we're gonna take it from the top. We're gonna go over all of C++. The, this is it, that's all there is in all of computer science, you know? And uh, at the end of these two hours, you will have a more or less thorough uh, understanding of C++. So uh, how accurate does it have to be? It has to be accurate. If you get a different number than me, it's wrong. How accurate is mine? I don't know. But you have to at least be as accurate as mine, or exactly as accurate as mine. Let's put it that way. Okay, so regular variables uh, just look like this in C++. Uh, the syntax here is type and then variable name. That's the syntax of a variable declaration. Syntax, what is a variable declaration in C++? You have to make a variable before you can use it. This confuses some people from the Python world where if you use a variable without declaring it, it just gets made for you. In C++, you must make a variable like this before you can use it like this. Now, uh, don't ever do this, by the way. Don't ever make a variable that's uninitialized. A primitive variable that's uninitialized is a uh, don't. Don't ever make a primitive without initializing it. Okay, primitive variables are int, char, double, float, short, unsigned, short, long, 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 unsigned, int, all these kinds of things, pointers, uh, are all primitive. Primitive variables are your basic variables that are built into the language itself. You've got non-primitive variables, um, non-primitive variables, which you call objects, initialize themselves. So, string s, okay. Strings hold one or more, uh, zero or more characters. They hold words, basically. Okay. Um, no sound issues here, are you guys in the Kearney or McCurley stream, Kearney? Okay. Um, okay. So don't do this. Whenever you make a primitive, always initialize it immediately. You will see a lot of professional programmers, you will see a lot of websites like Geeks for Geeks and all this kind of stuff that make uninitialized variables and it is bad practice. Um, I'm just gonna, that's a hill I'm willing to die on. Even if, even if you do something like this, like even if you're gonna like um, immediately be CNing into X like this, and that initial variable value that you give it isn't gonna get used, initialize it anyway. And the reason for that is because I have seen so many bugs caused over the years by people who think that their variables are initialized and they're, and they're not. And then they, they post onto Reddit or something, and they're like, my code works some of the time, but not all the time. And it's like, bro, just initialize it, it. Like I, the first thing I look for is I look at, 
I look at their code that looks like that, int x, no initialization, and they have something like, you know, if y is less than five, you know, cn into x, and, and I'm like tracing all the different ways that their code can run. I'm like, oh yeah, there is one way that it doesn't initialize x at all. And it's just like, don't ever expose yourself to that risk of having an uninitialized variable. Uninitialized variables are extremely dangerous because they cause unpredictable behavior. It'll sometimes run one way, it'll sometimes run another way. Even worse, if you compile it with the optimizer on, it might just always give it a value of zero. And then when you turn off the optimizer, it doesn't. And so your code crashes, you know, like if you have a array or something and you wanna see out uh, array square bracket X, right? Maybe with, the, maybe with the optimizer on, it always prints out zero. But you turn the optimizer off and it seg faults. Now you can't run your code with the optimizer off. Do you know how bad that is? It's really bad. And it's all because these people are too lazy to type equals zero, right? And, you know, it, like I said, this is a hill that I'm willing to die on. I've been teaching computer science for a long time. And this is one of those habits that if you get in the practice of doing it, it will save you a hell of a lot of pain and misery and suffering in the future. Trust me on this one. Just always initialize it. And you might be like, but it's so slow. I'm, I'm wasting all that time initializing x to zero and I'm about to read into it. If you care about speed, you're gonna turn the optimizer on. You're gonna compile your code like this, g++ dash 03 main.cc. You're gonna compile your code with the optimizer on. And if you do that, and if the optimizer does in fact determine that that value will never get used, it'll remove it. So it doesn't have a performance cost anyway. It'll only have a performance cost if it does in fact need to be initialized. Okay, this is, this is something I'm very passionate about. So please just always do this. Okay, so type, variable name, and uh, initial value. Now, what is a type? A type uh, they're good for zero. What's the difference between a double and a float? Uh, a double gets more precision. So, um, yeah, we're going to touch on auto today also. So, a type tells you what sort of data that value that variable can hold okay so ints you know hold from negative 2.1 billion and change to 2.1 billion and change a char holds one letter uh, essentially one ascii character uh, more technically uh, floats hold you know 0 0.001 type things um, strings hold you know Hello world type stuff. Okay. So uh, the the C plus plus type system, C plus plus has a static uh, type system. Once a variable is an int, it will always be an int. Can't change. Other other programming languages, you can dynamically change the type of variables on the fly. C plus plus does not have that as part of its uh, bug finding type system. The type system in C++ is designed not to compile if you make an oopsie. If you ever say x is equal to five, that's fine. If you say x is equal to 5.5, that's dubious, but uh, it, it, it'll do it. Um, it'll narrow from 5.5, x is now, um, let's make it not five, let's make it eight. Um, this is the same as x is equal to eight. You'll notice I'm getting a warning now, right? Like it's warning, implicit narrowing, right? Like you're, you're, you typed in 8.5, you're never gonna see 8.5. It's always gonna be eight because ints can't hold decimals. So that's a warning. But then if you try doing something like this and set it equal to squirrel, then that just won't work whatsoever and you get an error, okay? In other languages where you can just change the type of a variable on the fly, like <coughs> JavaScript, um, x would just become a string and then you're going to be very confused when you try doing math with it okay so what about casting data types yeah if you want to cast it uh you could do it like this there's a lot of different ways of doing it i'll just show you the official approved bjarni blessed version of casting and that is using the static cast function like this casting casting means to convert from one type to another. 
So if we try setting x equal to the string 8, that does not work. This is a string, a C style string. Um, can't convert it into an integer, even though it looks like it should be convertible. Can't do that. You have to use a function called stoy string to integer. Convert string to integer, like that. Okay, so what kind of types are real? Uh, why don't you guys in chat type out some of your favorite types? Type, <laughs> type, type in chat your favorite types. Okay, and we'll talk about them. Uh, what's the difference between compiling with G++ and G++ standard equals C++17? C++ releases new standards every three years. Uh, they're currently working on 23, obviously due out in next year. And um, they change what is available in um, the standard libraries more often. Occasionally they change the language itself. But they always preserve backwards compatibility, or very close to always. So if you... Uh, are using C++ 17, you're not going to see much difference between it and 14, but there were some nice additions in C++ 20. Nothing that's going to matter too much at your um, place you are right now. Okay. Classes, unordered maps, doubles, unsigned ints, arrays. Uh, we're going to talk about arrays and vectors later. Uh, int, double char, size t, auto. Yeah, okay, that's all good. That's all good stuff. So let's talk about them. So there's different integer types. So, um, and the different integer types just hold different ranges of integers. Integers are whole numbers, right? So if you have short s is equal to 10,000, do you guys know that you could use the apostrophe there? Shorts hold negative 65K to positive 65K or something like that. Or maybe I'm dividing by two or multiplying by two. I don't know. It's not a big, it's not a big amount. I don't use shorts very often. Um, and you can also make a uh, unsigned short, something like that. And it'll go from zero to 65,000, whatever. I'm not a math person. Uh, but you can use this. It's essentially like 10,000, but the comma operator has a meaning. So uh, you can actually put apostrophes into numbers like that to count groups of three digits. So you can, might, might be useful for the Zeta assignment where there's numbers that are like yay big, right? So. <laughs> uh, this is going to warn because that number is too big to fit into a short, right? So, 65,000, what is it, 535, that. What the heck is going on here? What, what? 535, there. there, that's fine. That is too big. Okay, that's an overflow. Four. No. Negative two. Wait. Okay. It's too big. That's fine. Okay. Anyway, I don't use shorts very often. That's that's the uptake on that. Um, and then there's unsigned versions of all the ends. Um, long is uh, a long is sometimes a 32-bit number it's sometimes a 64-bit number depends on the system you're on a long long is always going to be a 64-bit integer in most systems that i'm aware of um i don't like using long longs i you know i don't like using longs long longs shorts things like that i i, I really don't use them um because there's these options like this watch unsigned and 64-bit bomb. Okay, and so this creates a unsigned 64-bit number, and so it can hold 2 to the 64th power, minus 1, as the maximum value, whatever the hell that is. I'm sure there's some nerds out there that have 2 to the 64th power memorized. I do not. Um, 2 to the 64th power Minus one, there you go. That's the maximum value you can have in this uh, variable here, Bob. Okay, but what I want you to see there is is that type. So there's a, actually a bunch of types where you can actually specify how many bits you want, and this is actually preferable to me than using something like long, right? Because if, if you said like long um, Steve equals one two three four five six, whatever the actual number doesn't matter here. Um, how many bits is long? How many bits is Steve? Like, it, 
depends. It depends on the system you're on, and that's terrifying. Because what that means is that you move your code from one system to another, and the size of the variable changes, and the range of values it can hold changes out from under your feet. And, and that's, that's actually really terrifying. You know, if, if you go from a system where you can have a positive 2.1 to negative 2.1 integers, you go to another system and the integers shrink to 16 bits, which is allowed. Now you've got $65,000 max in your bank account instead of 2.1 billion, right? I don't know a whole lot of people that have more than 2.1 billion in their bank accounts, but there's a lot of people that have more than 65,000, right? Or at least 65,000 in debt, <laughs> right? It's called a mortgage. So uh, it's, it's actually really important to do this kind of stuff instead. If you want a 32-bit integer, just say I want a 32-bit integer, right? The only benefit int uh, has, right, like this, is that it will pick the fastest integer type for your system. So int is for speed, but uh, Lord help you if you move to a system where ints are bigger or smaller than what you expect. Okay, bigger is actually not that big a deal. Smaller is a, is a big deal, because now all of a sudden your integers are overflowing. You have no idea why. Things are crashing. You have no idea why. Unsigned ints are only positive. No, they can be zero also. Unsigned integers can be zero. Uh, zero is not a positive number. Okay, so, uh, and if you get tired of writing these long uh, type names out like this, you can do the following instead using u64 equals u int 64t. And then you can just say, I give, give me an unsigned 64 bit number, y, and set it equal to 6. Okay. Most projects I work on professionally have type aliases like this set up. And so I could just do like, give me a sign 32 bit number or give me a sign 32 bit number. It depends on the alias you have set up. Name Z, give me a uh, unsigned 16 bit number named you know, W, you know. And so they typically alias uh, signed and unsigned versions of 8 bit, 16 bit, 32 bit, and 64 bit into just three letter codes like that. If you use Unreal Engine development, Unreal Engine has type aliases like that set up for all their stuff. Okay. Uh, T stands for type, yeah. Um, needlessly, needlessly verbose in my opinion, but you know, I'm not a standards committee member. member. Um, there is something called size T, size T, um, um, size T is used when dealing with sizes, like the dot size function. Like if you want to find out how big a vector is, it will return a size T. Um, on our system size t and u64 are the same. Okay. So size t and u64 are the same on our system. But if you move to a 32-bit system, then size t turns into a 32-bit number. Okay. So um, size t matches the memory system of whatever computer you're on. Okay. And it's basically used whenever you're using like vector, like if you want to see how many elements are in a vector, it returns a size t. And it's, but it, for, for this class, it's an unsigned 64-bit number. Okay, uh, let's talk about auto. So auto, uh, auto means deduce the type of the variable from the right-hand side. So you can make an auto variable as well. You can say auto um, bot, <laughs> auto bots, no, transformers, no, okay, uh, equals, um, 10. So what is the type of bot? <laughs> what is the type? <coughs> what kind of variable is that? We just said auto bot equals 10. Uh, what is the type of bot? Isn't? Isn't? <laughs> uh, yeah, so this code here is exactly the same as if I wrote int bot. It deduces that it deduces the type of bot from the right hand side. So because int, uh, ten is an int, then bot is an int. Now what about um, this? What's the type? Autobot equals ten point oh. You almost spit up your water. Are you a Transformers fan, Mr. Moore? Would it ever deduce short? Uh, not with a number like that. No. Uh, float or double? Float or double? Float or double? It's a double. It's a double. So this is the same thing as if we had written double bot. Okay. 
And in fact, this is also a double. Okay, you don't need the zero. I put the zero because it looks better to me. There's a lot of professional programmers that code this way. They don't write the dot zero because it's not necessary. They just put a 10 dot, and that's a double. Now, if you want to make it a float, there you go. Type of bot now is float. So there are prefixes and suffixes to uh, to these things in C++. If you add a dot, if you if you add a f suffix to the end of it, it makes it a float instead of a double. It's 32 bits. A float is a 32 bit floating point number. A double is a 64 bit floating point number. The difference is the number of sig significant digits you have, and the size of the exponent you can have. So you get more precision with a with a double than a float. Um, Sometimes you care, sometimes you don't care. Um, I mm, I do a lot of games programming, and in games programming, we really don't care about getting, you know, 17 digits of precision most of the time. Sometimes, maybe, but most of the time we don't. But if you're doing something like a Mars rover, where you're, like, shooting towards Mars, like, it kind of matters you get enough significant digits to hit Mars, you know, like, I don't know. It, it just kind of depends on your needs, which one, which one's better. Uh, you don't need a D, because... Um, it's, it's a double by default. That's a double. Okay. All right. So auto str equals height. What is the type? What's the type of str? String, 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 string. String, strung. Wrong. All of you are wrong. This is not actually a string. The type of this is const char star. So it is a constant character pointer. So it's a pointer to a chunk of memory that holds the string of a C style string for high. Okay. So this is um, when you use double quotes like that, you are not making a C string. You are making a C style string from the C programming language, and we inherit all that cruft uh, for better or worse, mostly worse. Um, so it's not actually a string. Uh, this, however, is a C++ style string. Okay. It looks horrible, huh? Maybe. Um, so if you want a C++ string, you can do that. And then that allows you to do things like, um, I don't know, call that size on it or whatever. Which you can do. You can't do that with, uh, if you did that, wouldn't compile. See? You can't call functions on an array, right? But C++ style strings have a dot size function on it. So what is the type of str now? The type of str now isn't string, because we're calling dot size on the string. It's not int. What type does dot size return? It's on the screen. TA, TA coming through for you guys. <laughs> yeah, size underscore T. So uh, dot size returns a unsigned 64-bit number, aka size underscore T. So str is not a string. It is a 64-bit integer holding the number 5. <laughs> it's going to hold 5. And the type of it is going to be unsigned 64-bit or size underscore T. Uh, what is the functional difference between size underscore t and int? Int is a signed 32-bit number. It can hold positive numbers. It can hold negative numbers. And they go up to positive 2.1 billion and negative 2.1 billion. A unsigned 64-bit number holds values from 0 to that large uh, number that I've cleared off the screen. It's like 13 trillion billion or whatever. Um, yeah, 64-bit numbers can hold much bigger integers. All right, so uh, that is that. Let's move on. Um, Non-primitive variables, you don't need to initialize them. In fact, if you initialize a string to zero, um, this is uh, ac actually really horrible. Uh, this to me is actually one of the worst bugs, one of the worst language design features in C++. By habit, like I'm just used to initializing things to zero. And so sometimes I'll just be like string s equals zero and not think about it until my code crashes uh, because it will actually compile. It'll co compile, it'll run, 
and when you actually get get around, like it, it doesn't crash when you make it, maybe, but it crashes when you print it, and uh, then it will seg fault your code and die. So, so that's cool. <laughs> And it doesn't even tell you why. Terminate called after throwing an instance of stood logic error. Construct null not, oh yeah, actually it did tell you. Construct null not valid. We're passing null to a to a constructor. And the reason for that is because I'm using the safe, the safe C++ library. Um, so, or maybe not, I don't know. Uh, but uh, it is undefined behavior if you initialize a string to zero. And what it will do is it, it will kill your program. You can't. You can't initialize a string to any other number, just zero. And if you initialize it to zero, it kills your program. And so I actually wrote a letter to the um, um, people who take proposals for the C++ standards. I'm like, you probably, we should probably fix this. And they're like, oh, it's, it's getting fixed for 23. So, uh, so for the first time, I have good news from you guys. When I reported something, they're actually, yes, we're actually, that's actually a problem and we're taking care of it. So yay, you know, that, that actually made my heart happy. Also made me happy that somebody else was doing it because I don't want to go, all, I don't want to do all that work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. You have to write a paper and, you know, you have to go through the technical standard and find the places where it's going to change. And now nah, I don't want to do that. I'm glad someone else did. Okay. Should one use null for zero instead? Uh, yeah, if you initialize this to null pointer, it makes it more clear why it's crashing. But this is still bad. Don't do it. There's no benefit to initializing a string to an old pointer. Um, it'll still it'll still kill your program. Right. So uh, the reason why it, the, and and that's the reason why you can initialize it to zero if you're wondering because zero is null and string takes a pointer as a constructor and so you can pass null in. It's undefined behavior. There's no benefit to doing it. It's just it's all bad. So don't so don't do that. So rather than doing that, uh, just that. Okay. It will initialize itself to empty string. Okay. So we'll print nothing. Yep. It'll initialize itself to empty string if you don't do anything. Okay. Um, hmm. any, any other things, uh, Mincarelli, about types that we should talk about? Um, auto is kind of interesting, kind of fun. Uh, oh, yeah, prefixes. There are prefixes, right? So you have int. Um, we already have x existing. Let's go up here. x is equal to 0x f. So this is the same thing as writing x is equal to 15. If you ever have 0x on something, that doesn't mean 0 times f. That means hexadecimal. So if you have any uh, numeric constant like that prefixed with a 0x, uh, that is saying I'm doing base 16 arithmetic. Um, so for example, that number there is the number 16. Okay, so 0x10 is 16 because it's a base 16 system, not a base 10 system. Okay. Um, there's also binary. So you can set x equal to a binary number if you want to do it in that way. Um, 10, 10, 10. 42. X is equal to 0, 1, 0. Octal. Base 8. Hey, what about a X equals um, apostrophe A apostrophe? So like X equals yes, thank you. letter A. X is equal to A. Um, anytime you do uh, single quotes like that, it does an ASCII table lookup. So uh, people think that the type of this is like a character. Uh, anytime you do single quotes, it's it's actually just returning a number. So anytime anytime you uh, use single quotes, it's just uh, it's gonna it's gonna look up what the ASCII code is for a, and so it's gonna set x equal to ninety seven. We compile this. 
97. And it's complaining I'm not using the type alias. Fine. <laughs> Okay. So you can see it's 97. And this is actually really useful. Like if you want to uh, make a game like Hangman and you want to like keep track of like which letters have been typed before and stuff like that, you can like read a character from the keyboard and then you can have like an array, like uh, let me do a Boolean array size 256. And I can say like array X is equal to true. And then, um, and then later on if they type in a again, I can check the array and oh, it's true already, and then write back oh, sorry, um, you've already typed, you've already guessed A before for hangman, um, sorry, hang person, and uh, you can't uh, uh, you can't guess the same letter twice, right? So um, auto A uh, equals A is an int. That's a good question. Uh, I think it's a char actually, but chars are just integers. Chars are eight bit integers. It's it's. It's one of the more annoying things in, in C++ actually, is that if you want to make just like an 8-bit eight, eight integer, like that, you know, named, um, I don't know, Lolo, set it equal to, I don't know, 98. If you try just, like, I just want, I just want an 8-bit integer, right? I, just, I, I don't need all these big numbers. I, my numbers are going to be between negative uh, 128 and 127. You know, I just want an 8-bit integer, right? If you output it, um, it out, it outputs the ASCII code equivalent of it. Super annoying. Super annoying. This is not a char. That's not a char. That's an 8-bit integer. I just want to use math on these 8-bit integers. But C++, if you ever see out an 8-bit integer, uh, it converts it to character for you and prints out the ASCII value instead. It's annoying. It's super annoying. So you have to uh, cast it to integer or whatever. Is not the Bjarni approved way of doing it. This is the Bjarni way of approved way. This is the old way of doing it, but it's less typing. So now I've got 98. Okay. Cool. Well, let's move on. Uh, that was variables, input and output. Hopefully, you guys learned some stuff about variables today and IO stuff. Okay, so IO stands for input and output. The uh, basics are keyboard and screen. Reading and writing to a file is um, pretty pretty similar. It's one one line of code different. So if you want to read a variable from the keyboard, you can cn into x like that. Reads one integer in, in from the keyboard. X is an integer, so it reads an integer from the keyboard. Um, C out x prints the integer x to the screen. Okay. So that's your basic input and output. Um, if you want to do this with a file, uh, files are just one extra step. So you do an input file stream. Like this. And so this opens a file opens a file named file.txt in the local directory for reading. And then you can do ends into x, read one integer from the file into x. So you can see it's the exact same line of code as from the as from the keyboard, except there's, there's like I said, for reading from a file, it's exactly the same as reading from a keyboard, except there's one line of code extra. And that's line that, where you, where you tell it the name of the file that you're going to open, and then you give it the name of a variable that you're going to use to read from. So that's that's it. Reading, writing, and, and the same for writing to a file. Um, of stream outs file two dot text and outs x. So this is going to read one integer from file dot text, then write that file into file two dot text. Okay. Downside is this erases file to that text. So just be careful. If you add anything important in there, it's going to be gone. Okay. So I'm actually going to comment these out just so I'm not randomly um, reading and writing to files. On disk. Okay. Um, uh, Times when I look up code, they usually don't have uh, namespace standard. Yeah, I prefer it uh, because if I took that out, then uh, I would have std colon colon std colon colon std colon colon all over the place, 
Uh, I don't like STDs, so I, I just put that in there. Um, the hype, the, the fear of using namespace STD is way overblown. They're like, but how do you know? How do you know if the C out that you're writing to is the C out in the standard library? And I'm like, what other C outs are there? <laughs> you know, like if, if somebody like went to the effort of making their own C out, then I wouldn't import them into my namespace and I'd be like, all right, I'm using Bob's C out or whatever, you know, like that's fine. Namespaces are fine. They're there for a reason. But like the standard library, like I, I know that CN and Cout are the standard library CN and Cout. Like I, I know this. I don't need to waste five letters literally every time I do anything in the standard library. And the number of times I forget stood, you know, uh, grossly overweighs any risks of but what if you write to the wrong C out? What if you use the wrong inline? Not, it's, yeah, it's just not an issue. Um, yeah, that's the standard library string. I know this, it's not, it's not confusing. It's literally never once in a long time of programming has it ever burned me. Once, once I had an issue where like it wouldn't compile because some function name conflicted or something. And then I took a moment, I looked at him like, oh, that's a standard library name. And I changed the name of my thing. And that was it. One time in, you know, 10, 20 years, whatever. You know, that's had, that's been an issue. Versus l religiously putting a stood on everything. And when you forget to put a stood, it doesn't compile. Yeah, it's a cost-benefit thing that works out in favor of using namespace standard. And that's a hill that I'm reasonably willing to die on. The one exception being you should not put it into your header files. So if you look at my header file, I do not have that in there. So in my header file, I have std colon colon all over the place. Because if somebody uses my header file, because if somebody uses my header file, that's a decision for them to make. They get to decide whether or not they want to use namespace standard, not me. Okay. So in my header file, I don't put it in there because if I put it in there, then they then I've made the choice for them, and I'm not going to do that. Because I, 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 I realize there's a lot of people that like their STDs and that more power to them. Okay. Um, a lot of hills to die on. Yeah, it's, it's computer science. Everybody's got, you know what they say, everybody's got an opinion, right? So, um, you know, everyone's, everyone else is wrong, I'm right. You know, that is, it's just a general attitude that people have. But um, in this case, I'm right and they're wrong. No, I'm kidding. Uh, no, in, in, in all honesty, most professors disagree with me. So um, probably 90% of professors would be having a, a stroke right now if they saw me recommending you using using namespace standard. Okay, so that's input and output. The, uh, the one thing uh, you have to do with input and output is error checking. Every time you read input from anywhere, you need to check for an error every time without fail. If you're not checking for an error, your code's wrong. Okay. Kearney is the one dentist that doesn't recommend the toothpaste. <laughs> it's more like, you know, like, uh, you know, three out of four dentists recommend chewing extra gum. You know, I'm like, but would I recommend it? No. <laughs> if you want to, sure. Would I recommend you chew gum? No, it's your choice. Yeah. So, uh, Kearney's going to tell us fluoride doesn't work. <laughs> no, no, no. My, my views are not conspiracy theories um, or anything like that. It's, it's just based on actual real life experience. And I, I have a feeling a lot of these dangers that people warn about don't come about from experience, but from sort of like some nebulous fear that maybe someday that somebody will make a different see out and you'll see out to the wrong one, which just doesn't seem like a thing that would happen to me. I don't know. Who knows? Probably somewhere out there somebody made a variable called see out. I don't know. Okay. So, um, error checking. So, every time you read a variable in, uh, check to see if an error occurred like that. If CN, this means uh, an error occurred. 
So get get used to that. It's also important to check to see if like the value is good. So if an error occurred or if x is less than you know like zero, or, I don't know, like you know, uh, then die or something. I don't know. Um, so on your homework assignments, I, I typically make a die function. The die function just like prints out bad input and quits. Um, in a professional program, you don't do that. In a professional program, you don't just quit, you know, the second anything goes wrong, you know. Um, if, I, if I come up here in, in PuTTY and I go to the font size and I try typing in squirrel here where it expects a int, I, I get a dialog. Size must be a number, right? It doesn't just bloop, quit, <laughs> you know what I mean? So professionally, you have to handle it. Uh, for homework assignments, you typically will just be like, uh, quit. And, and the reason why I do that is because uh, handling errors is actually uh, complicated, right? Like every variable you read could be wrong, right? And so you have to get into the habit of doing it. And um, uh, it can be time consuming. So I just give you a simple, easy way out. An error occurred, quit. Just so that you get into the habit of always checking your input, always because you never want to have unvetted input. Uh, is Mr. Bell still here? Uh, I don't see him. He does web work. And, and when, you, when, you, when you're working on the web, you're getting input from random people you don't know on the internet. And a lot of those people are going to be either dumb or hostile, sometimes both. And you have to make really, really careful sure that when somebody types in a name, it's actually a name and not Bobby Tables, right? The semicolon, close quote drop, you know, tables. Yeah, don't trust the user, not even yourself. Um, not even yourself. So every time you do error checking, um, do that. So if, uh, if somebody types in squirrel for x, then that will set cn to be false, and we probably should do it immediately, right? Um, after it, after every read, after every read, I, ch I check to see if an error occurred. Both type mismatch, like if they type in scroll when it's supposed to be an integer, or if the value is not in the range that I'm looking for. Like if it's if we're inputting a user's age and they type in 30,000, then uh, unless they're a vampire, that's nobody alive is 30,000, die, right? Or in, in reality, I would handle it with a dialog box or something. But for this class, just it's fine to just get into the habit of always vetting your input, always checking always making sure that values are good. Okay. So, uh, is try catch better than cn.fail? Uh, it depends if it throws an exception or not, right? Like, um, if it doesn't throw an exception, then try, try catch isn't, isn't going to help you. All right. So, uh, no, the better way of doing IO, by the way, is this. Um, so if you say, see out, please enter your age that and you read it in and then um, you know in reality what you're gonna do is say if not CN then uh, CN dot clear the error CN dot ignore and throw the error the erroneous code away and then all of this needs to be written into a while X is zero and this and that and equal to zero and then this and that and there. So you have to do this every time you read an integer in. Please enter your age. And actually that should probably be inside of there. There. So please enter your age. You know, x is x is zero, right? And then they enter the age. If an error occurred, then it clears the error, it throws the bad input away, it sets x to zero, does it again. If they did type in five or forty two or something, then it continues. And so you have to do this every time you read a variable. And it's so long and, and obnoxious that people just don't do it. And so programmers get into a bad habit of accepting bad input. And that's and that's one of the reasons why I wrote my read function. My read function int x is equal, you know, int age is, age is equal to read. Please enter your age. 
It's actually kind of funny. I used to create accounts on the internet born on January 1st, 1901. And it's fun to see what's happened now that it's like 20 years later, right? Like a lot of web, like Steam, like barfed. Um, uh, various websites like don't allow, like, please enter your age. I try typing in 111 and it's like, that's too old. And I'm like, that's what my account says, you know? And so my account has an age that I literally can't enter now because they're like, you're, you would be too old. There's no 120 year old people using the internet, you know? So uh, I, I've gotten locked out of accounts because they wouldn't literally let me enter the age that they have on record for me, you know? So uh, are there a lot of while loops in C++? Um, yeah, so um, while loops or for loops, whatever. We'll, we'll talk about loops next. Um, so this is like uh, how you should read every time. Uh, or you can use a do while loop. Um, do this while x is equal to zero, something like that. Okay, uh, or this. So this one line of code here does all that. So unfortunately, my read library is not part of the C++ standard. It is available on our server though. Here, I hope that you all someday will be as proud of something as I am of Readlib, because it makes input and output, well, just input, so much easier, so much easier. It handles errors, reprompts if there's a mistake. Um, it's it's just it, it makes life so much nicer. And and when I submitted it to the uh, people to get approved, they're like, well, who uses C in and C out these days? You know? <laughs> uh, how do I get the read library to do that? It's a function that does this, basically. That's it. Um, are you allowed to use read library in assignments? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. That's what it's there for. And it just makes life nicer. It just makes life so much nicer to do that. So that reads in an integer, and if... Here, I'll just run it for you. Ah, no. No. Damn it. <laughs> Start over. My age is squirrel. Losing your age. Yep. Oh, it's in a do while. Oh, yeah. I was like, it was broken. No, I just have the thing twice. Right. Okay. <laughs> it's confused by that. So this is me, and then that's the do while loop. Okay. Uh, do you use the read library professionally? Absolutely, yeah. I, I use it in all my work now. Even for reading from files, things like that. Yeah. And, and that's the thing that kind of gets me, because like it doesn't just work with the keyboard, which, fair enough, like there's not a lot of terminal applications professionally. A lot of people still use IO streams for, or F streams for reading from files. Um, you know? there's It's not that fast, but it Everybody knows it, and so a lot of people use F streams to read and write to files. So, bugs me, bugs me that you have to go like, you have to do all this to do it properly, and so most people don't, and that really bugs me when people write bad code. All right, let's talk about loops. Uh, loops are what number? Uh, I O. Oh, algebra. Okay, fine. Um, algebra. There is add, subtract. Multiply, divide, modulus. X equal to x plus 1, x plus equals 1, x plus plus. All these add 1 to a number. x is equal to 8 times 4, modulus x. I don't know. Uh, Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally applies. Uh, modulus is the remainder operator. So when you do long division, the, uh, the answer you get is from this, the remainder you get is from that. Okay. 
Does your read library have a patent or ownership? No, it's GPL. It's under the GNU public license. How would you write it so it reads from a file and not from a keyboard? Uh, where did my files go? Here. Oops. Where do you go? That. Pretty easy, right? Seems easy. Seems easier than this. So you do that, you gotta error check it, you know? To clear the error. Yeah. Okay, so, I don't know, algebra, it's algebra. It's the same. All right, so let's do loops. Uh, no, we're on conditionals, sorry. All right, so you got your ifs, you got your else ifs, and you got your else's. All right, so the way that a conditional works is uh, an if statement works by evaluating what is inside the uh, parentheses if when the expression, an expression is anything that goes between parentheses, is true, it executes the following code block. So if x is less than 5, see out high. Single line is a code block. Or you can say if x is less than 5, So if you have a single line of code, you do not need curly braces. Um, it, depending on your style guides, your, a lot of style people, a lot of style guides will mandate you put in curly braces anyway. Uh, I tend not to if something is really short. Um, and you can either put it on the next line in indent, or you can do it there. Or um, everything between So everything, if, if x was in fact less than 5, then it will print out yo-ho, yo-ho, a pirate's life for me. And also hi, because it'll do both of these in order. Now, uh, an else statement, um, and you can indent like this or like this, doesn't matter to me. Um, um, see how no pirate life for you. So else's, 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 else's are mutually exclusive with ifs. With the, the if part. If the if part runs, the else part does not run. If the else part runs, the if part does not run. It will do exactly one of the branches. This is pretty important. So um, make sure you understand this. It, it will definitely do one of these two branches. I don't know which because I don't know what the user is going to type in for X, but it will definitely always print either Yoho Yoho Pirate's Life for me or No Pirate's Life for you, not both. Not neither, either. It will definitely do one of those two. Okay. And then um, there's also these conditionals, things called switches. You don't use switches. Okay. So that's my second doot. Doot. Don't uninitialize variable. Don't ever make a variable without initializing it. And don't use switch statements. Uh, first thing I see anytime 
uh, I'm on Reddit or something, and somebody's like, I, this code's not working right, and they have a switch statement, like, I'm, it's like 50-50, like, their switch statement's wrong. Uh, so what is, what is a switch statement? You can, like, uh, switch x and say, like, if it's 5, you know, whatever, case 5, sorry, case 5, um, do something. Uh, it's garbage, and I'll show you why it's garbage. So string name equals read. Please enter your name. Um, so this is how I would write the code instead. So if name equals bill, stay out printing. Else if name equals justice, stay out Corelli. Else if name equals Pablo, see out Gonzalez. Else if name equals Michael, see out Juarez. Else see out name not recognized. Okay. Now, if you want to do this with a switch, you could go like switch name, except you can't switch on names only works on integers. So they're garbage. Don't use it. Don't ever use switches, in my opinion. There, there's a very small niche case where you might get an optimization using a switch, but in general, you should always prefer if, else, if, else, if, else, if, else, if, else, if, else standards. And let the optimizer speed it up for you, if that's what you're worried about. Um, yeah, don't use switch statements. Trust me on this. Just don't use them. They're terrible. They're absolute garbage. Because switch x so if x is equal to, you can't do inequalities. Like you can't say like, uh, you know, if x is less than six and x is greater than two. Like you can't do compound things. You can do a single, a single case. Now the one time switches are worthwhile is when you're using enums with them. But um, I'm not going to say don't use switches ever. But pretty close to it. Pretty close to it. See how five was entered. Now. Okay, six, there's a problem with this code. Six was entered. The problem with this is that in between case statements, um, it'll actually drop through to the next one. And everybody forgets the break statement in there. That's why they're garbage. That's why they're garbage. Don't use them. Trust me. I've been teaching this for a long time. When it, whenever I see something cause problems for students and cause bugs, and cause unpredictable behavior and is less powerful and less helpful than something, I just tell people not to use it. There's no reason to use it. Like it's not like you're, there's a assignment you're not gonna be able to complete if you use um, if else, if else, if else, if else. It's just more powerful. The only downside is there's in some limited cases um, better, better speed. The only time that switches actually make sense is when you're working with an enum and you guys don't really know enums yet, so don't worry about it. Okay. Hey, menu options, menu options, sure. Yeah, if you have an enum that has menu options, sure. Okay. Uh, your other professor says, so opposite yes to switch statements for like something like this with names. What was that, Justice? Uh, ternary operator. Went over that uh, yeah, yeah, let's go over ternary operator. Um, when, when would, uh, uh, Ephraim, when would your professor use a switch statement? Because with a menu option, yeah, absolutely. Because that's, that's an enum. That's like the one time they're justifiable. Yeah, that's fine. Using it with the menu options. Um, they're okay with, you know, they qualified the statement properly. Uh, for something like this, uh, they don't even work for one thing. So. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the ternary operator. Ternary operator. Uh, ternary operator is, uh, is, an expression, not a statement, which is nice. Remember, expressions are things that can go inside a set of parentheses, right? Five plus three is an expression. You can put that inside of a parentheses. But an if statement, you can't put inside of a parentheses, right? Like, like that doesn't, it doesn't work, right? Um, it's a statement. Statements are things that end in semicolon or okay. so uh, no it's not possible um, 
Okay, so uh, if um, um, pool first player equals read, is it the first player's turn? So we're going to ask the user, is it the first player's turn? They're going to type in one for true, zero for false. And then we can say um, first player question mark. And so this actually, uh, should be an underscore there. Uh, this actually uh, embeds a if statement inside of a cout statement. Uh, and it, and it, yeah, it holds an expression, right? Inside of a cout statement. So basically it checks to see, is first player true? If first player is true, then it will see out first player go. If it's not the first player's turn, then it will see out second player go. And so that way you don't have to have an if. It, it actually allows you to kind of combine your code um, if you have two possibilities and make it a little bit more compact and uh, maybe arguably not more readable. A lot of people are confused by the ternary operator, um, but it is a core part of the C language, C++ language, and the Java language as well. And in situations like this, they're perfectly fine. In some cases, they're job security because nobody can understand what you're doing. Uh, so the colon, let me break it down for you. So the question mark says, if whatever is in front of the question mark is true, then this expression evaluates, the expression is everything between the parentheses, right? The expression will evaluate to first player go. If this is false, then that's what the colon's for. It separates the if and the else. Then it will evaluate to second player go. So it's like saying if first player evaluate to that, else evaluate to that. Okay. Does that run faster? Uh, maybe, I don't know. You're gonna have to benchmark it. I, I can't see it being I don't see it making any difference in performance, but um, sometimes you can radically restructure your code, so it might. Um, depends how you implement it. Like if you're constantly doing a test on the first player, it might be better to break it out to if first player, else if second player, you know, and then you don't have to constantly be doing if statements. So it, it kind of depends. Yeah. Uh, they're not they're not faster. They, they, in general, it should compile down about the same, to the same assembly, even. Um, yeah. It's just a, you know, what you consider more readable. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, yeah. So in C++, you have if, else, and then if you want to do an if, else, if, else, if, else, if, else, if, else, if. Like that, here I have everything on one line. Uh, sometimes you have like, you know, yeah, but more like this. Um, like I said, a lot of professors want you to use the semi, uh, the curly braces every time. Um, I'm not one of them, so. Okay, so those conditionals, uh, let's talk about loops. Loops, okay. Um, there's uh, four kinds of loops in C++. Five kinds of loops in C++. I use three of them. Okay. So the first loop is, uh, the, the main two that I use are the for loop and the while loop. Okay. So uh, I use for loops when I know how how many times a loop will run, I use while true loops when I don't know how many times it will run. Okay. So like if I want to print out hello world 10 times, I'm going to use a for loop because I know I need 10, it's going to run 10 times, right? So I'm going to say for and i equals Zero, i is less than 10, i plus plus, see yeah. out, hello world. Okay. So I know that this code will run exactly 10 times. This is a code pattern that all of you should memorize. Memorize this code pattern. Okay. You should be able to just spit it out. If you need something to run 50 times, 
you change the 10 to a 50. Okay, thanks. You change the 10 to a 50. If you need it to run 55 times, you change it to a 55. Okay, I see some people that do like a one and no, don't, don't do that. Just follow this code pattern. This is the correct code pattern. And this is another hill that I will die on because this code pattern here matches the way the standard library works. The standard library starts at zero. Like if, if you have an array of size 50, you start at zero and you go up to less than 50, i.e. 49. Like this matches how the language itself is designed. This is the correct code pattern to do a for loop. Okay. And uh, do an example of a for loop with a couple ifs inside, sure. So 50 times we're gonna do this thing and um, like, oh, I don't know, fizzbuzz or something like that. Yeah, I gotcha. So if I is, I'm not gonna do, eh, sure, okay. So if I is divisible by 10, then C out um, fizz and else if i is divisible by 23 i'm not doing fizzbuzz exactly for you Let's see out buzz okay um if i is equal to 42 continue continue jumps to the top of the loop and runs again according to nante uh michael juarez he said at uc santa cruz a lot of professors <laughs> Oh, classic bug, classic bug. The single equals, not the double equals. Um, the uh, single equals would set i to be 42. That's a classic, classic mistake there. Don't talk Don't talk and type at the same time. Um, so at Santa Cruz, apparently, some of his professors there hated continue. I don't know why. Um, it's very useful. Like if I'm parsing a file, and I'm reading through the file, and I encounter an error somewhere within it, like there's a corruption on that line, then I hit continue and it jumps to the top of the loop. It reads the next line of the file and it moves on with its life. It's just a, it, it's really nice. Like you just go as far as you can. And then if something happens, continue, jump back up to the top, keep going. Um, there's, it, it's really useful. I don't know why you would hate it, but it's there. And then uh, if I is equal to, double equals to, I should say, um, 45 break, um, So loop, uh, the loops are broken by break, and so that will jump to the closed curly brace here and continue on down. So this loop will run from zero equal to 45. When I is 45, it'll go through this whole thing here. When it hits this line, it's like, yes, I is equal to 45. It terminates, and then it comes down here and keeps running the program. It only terminates the loop. It does not terminate the program. Okay. Um, so uh, you can only die in one hill. No, because I'm, I'm not going to die. <laughs> it's the other people that are wrong. So, um, so I subtracted by two. Okay. Um, all right. So that is a for loop. Now, a while loop is used. Um, I, I typically do a while true. Um, sometimes I'll do like a while CN, like as long as an error has not occurred, you know, that that's fairly common or you do a while cn into a string or something that's pretty common too so it tries reading into a string and if an error occurs the loop doesn't run and it moves on with life um, but while true is probably the most common that I write and that means infinite loop okay so every time you have an infinite loop you need a break inside there somewhere So, um, int x is equal to read, um, enter your monies, I don't know. You need to have a break somewhere within your code or it'll literally run forever, right? But you see, when I, when I say like, you don't know how many times it'll run, like if you're doing something like processing tax receipts, you don't know how many tax receipts they have. They probably don't know either. Um, and so they're just gonna be pulling out a tax receipt being like, all right, 32 bucks. All right, $1.67 in crackers, business expense, you know. Um, so uh, when, when, when they get to the end, they'll type in a zero, hit return, and then you break. Okay, so, and then 
you know, probably you're going to add this to a vector or something like vector events, name receipts. And so every time they type in a number, you're going to say receipts, uh, push back. That. Also, I should mention that the x here is not the same x as above. Something I, I mentioned in the previous class, but not in this one. So you cannot have uh, you cannot have two variables with the same name in the same scope, right? That won't compile. Redefinition of x can't do it. But if it's in a different scope, like while true, true, that's fine, and it doesn't even have to be the same type. That's fine. You can have the same variable with different. Uh, same variable, same name. Uh, different variable, the same name, I should say. Same name, different variable. As long as they're not in the same scope. A scope is a region between curly braces, right? So a scope is the area between an open open brace and a closed brace, and uh, variables, um, stack allocated variables live until they hit the end of their scope. So. So uh, float the 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 float x and stir go away here. Okay, so when you hit the close curly brace, that's when they get deallocated. Now the really weird thing is that you can do this. You can see out x, and as long as it's not shadowed, as long as it's not shadowed, this is actually going to print that zero because this guy doesn't exist yet, right? But if you do that, this is going to print out negative ten thousand. So this one prints out zero, this one prints out 10,000 because the variable's been shadowed. You've got two variables with the same name in a different scope. So whichever scope is closest to wins. Okay. You guys understand? It's called variable shadowing. And that's just so you don't have to keep track of every variable that you've used ever. So yeah, so for a while, while loops, I use them when I don't know in advance how many times I'm going to do something. For fizzbuzz, you know that you're going to run 100 times, so you use a for loop. Okay. Uh, what are my text editors opening in the command line? It looks like you're opening your vimrc file, which is your configuration file for, uh, for vim. So, all right, so that's loops. Oh yeah, there's other loops too. Uh, there is the, uh, the range-based for loop, right? So if you want to, you've got a string, str, hello, str, to hello. And you want to print out all, you, if you want to print it out vertically, h return, e return, l return, you can do it a couple different ways. Size t i equals zero, i is less than hello, str dot size, i plus plus. out hello stir dot at i line. so this says beginning at the beginning of the string going to the end of the string one letter at a time print out that letter of the string and then hit the return key hit the enter key okay uh, this is very common with strings with vectors you typically start at the beginning and go to the end uh, not always like you can go halfway if you wanted if you wanted to print out the first half, you could divide by two or whatever, but usually it's the whole thing. And But if you're going to be doing the whole thing, then you should be using a range-based for loop instead. A range-based for loop looks like this. For every character in the string, see how the character followed by the enter key. And this and this does the same thing. character in hello string, print out that character followed by an inline. And in the previous class, Ben Corelli is like, shouldn't that be const? And sure, why not? Uh, it, it'll run exactly the same way, but there's a general trend that you should const everything that could be consts, consted. There's benefits of it. Okay. 
uh, when do you make it at C when you need it to be called by reference. So if you're going to be changing it, so rather than outputting it, let's say that you're going to be changing it to like C is equal to 2 upper C, uh, you need to be called by reference if you're going to, and it can't be const obviously. Um, yeah, it's the same. It's the same as functions, call by value, call by reference, call by const reference. It's the same same exact syntax for range based for loops. And so you have to choose call by value, call by reference, call by const reference for a range based for loop. Um, const things you don't want to change. Yeah, yeah. In in general, it's just good practice to const things. You know, like you know, maybe you try to const this one. Can't do it right because I I changes right. I gets bigger every time. So you can't do it always, right? But um, like here, first if first player doesn't change, constant, you know? You understand? Like in, in general, it, it probably would change though, so I'm not gonna, not gonna do that. Um, like if your name doesn't change, constant. Make everything constant that you can. Yep. It's just good practice. And this one, constant. Range based for loop works only for one line of code. It works for everything. It's it's it, all of these things that work with if statements. Everything, the the rule is always that um, if it's one line of code, you don't need curly braces. If it's um, uh, if you need more, you can see out. Uh, my name is Nigo 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 Antoya. Father, Eric, and I. Um, int x equals read. You know, you can you do whatever you want inside of here. It'll just do it for each letter in the in the character, each character in the string rather. Like, yeah, it's fine. All these all these things work with either one liners or with code block uh, with the block of code. Yeah. Right. Um, okay, so then there's a couple other. So these are the three loops that I use: regular for loop, range based for loop, and uh, while true loop. Uh, instead of while true, you could always do this. Of course, you can always do uh, for semicolon semicolon. That's actually Identical, so some people do that instead. It's reasonably common. Each each part of the for loop is actually optional. So you can say for blank i is less than ten i plus plus. Like if i already exists, you can do that. I've seen that before. In fact, on the Z assignment, I, I have a for loop like that. I write while true. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, okay, so let's talk about the two loops I don't use. Don't use. Do while loops. I think I have one up here, right? Yeah, do while. Well. Alright. Uh, mark X, D single quote X, Shift G, and paste. There we go. Do while loops are weird because they have a semicolon at the end of them, which is unlike every other thing. Um, so do while loops will run once guaranteed. And then if this thing is still zero at the end of the day, then it goes back up to the top and does it again. And we can even make this less than or equal to zero so that if they type in a negative age, then it'll reject that and, and reprompt them again. Uh, do while loops aren't bad. Um, I should just say um, I don't use do while loops 99% of the time, but I do, I think, use them occasionally if in public read.h. No, that's still a while loop. Okay. Um, yeah. There's nothing wrong with them. They just look a little weird because they got the semicolon at the end. And then the fifth type of loop you should not use. This one is a don't, don't use this. Okay. The 
this is valid C++. It will do an infinite loop that will print hello world an infinite number of times. Um, don't ever write code like this. I only mention it for the sake of completeness and because it causes, at least in the previous class, the student who just gradu you know, is graduating or just graduated with a bachelor's degree had never seen this before in C++, so I did this kind of, kind of to screw them a little bit. Programming used to take place using a lot of go-to statements. A go-to statement jumps to that line of code. It ignores all scopes, all curly braces. They're horrible. Uh, people used to code them like a lot. Like, the basic programming language is very much based on the go-to statement, or go sub also. Uh, and then in 79, a guy by the name of Edsker Dykstra wrote a paper called uh, Go-To Considered Harmful. And everyone kind of agreed with him, and we stopped using it. So it's actually probably one of the most influential papers in computer science. Because everyone was like, you know what, you're right. <laughs> Edsker Dykstra is like, this is a hill I'm going to die on. Go-to sucks. You shouldn't use it. And everyone went, Got a good point there. <laughs> Why not deprecate GoTo? Because it's actually used extensively in the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel uses GoTo statements for uh, its exception handling, because C does not have exception handling. And so what they do is something like this. Um, well, I'm going to leave that in there, because it's a loop. Whoop. There, there we go. Uh, what they do, though, is something like this. Like, if x is less than 0, then they go to clean up like that and then down somewhere they have cleanup and then they like free you know this pointer or whatever and then they return so basically all throughout their code they're going to have a bunch of different places where they're like checking for errors and all the errors if they occur they go to the cleanup section the cleanup section frees up the memory so you only have to have the cleanup code in one place and then it returns and so it's like a, it's like exception handling they the, and they use go to's extensively so it's not no, it's a C thing. Like the Linux kernel is written in C, not C plus plus, and they don't have exceptions in C, so they use go tos, and it works out. You know, Linux is very stable. So, um, you don't want to use a function because there's an overhead to calling a function. Plus, you don't even know what what needs to be cleaned up, right? This is like it, like you're in a block of code that's been allocating memory that block of code is responsible for unallocating its block of code. And so all the unallocates are at the bottom. And uh, they jump to the bottom like that. So, uh, yeah, GoTo is in C++. There's no reason to use it. But C++ maintains backwards compatibility with C. So there you go. I I've actually used it. Hmm. No. I used I used uh, I used uh, um, long jump and set jump, um, which is like go to. It performs a non-local go to, so it can jump anywhere in your code. So I, I actually use that as part of a, a thread manager. So I basically wrote a, a program that could do multi-threading, uh, multiple flows of execution running at the same time on the same CPU on different cores uh, or different processors or whatever. And it would go to, like, it would remember where it was and then jump to where it was on the other end and run that for a while and then save it and then jump back to that place. And then, so it actually used go to's to kind of jump between the different threads. Um, yeah, it's basically go to. Don't write a loop like that, though. I will, I will hunt you down if you, if you did that. Okay, um, long jump. Yeah, it's funny. So, uh, yeah, don't don't do that. All right. So that was loops. I uh, got functions. Um, so a function uh, is uh, like this. So a function is a reusable bit of code. So anytime you do something over and over again, like oh I don't know, this read function that I wrote by hand over and over again. That's a candidate for a function. Like anytime you write something over and over again in your code, pull it out, put it into a put it put it into a function, 
then call the function. Okay. So function's a reusable bit of code. The syntax for a function is this return type function name parameter list function body. So if we come up here, look at die, the return type is void. Void return type means it doesn't return anything. Uh, parameter list is empty. It doesn't take any parameters. You just call die. You just call die like this. Um, the function name is die. And the function body is this part right here. So uh, one thing that people don't know is um, default parameters. Those are kind of fun. A lot of people hate them for some reason. I don't know. But like, let's say you want to make it so that you can have a customizable error message so that um, if you just call die, it prints out bad input and quits. But maybe you want it so that you can pass in a specific error message like uh, somebody typed in a negative age versus somebody typed in squirrel, right? Somebody typed in a string where it's expecting an integer. So if you wanted to do that, you can have this error message equals double quote. And so you can still call the code like this. And if you call the code like this, die, with no parameter, then the parameter will default to empty string. Okay? And then you can say if the error message is empty string, we'll print out bad input. Otherwise, we will output the error message. Okay? Um, that makes sense. So you can call this function. Two ways. You can call it die, in which case it prints out bad input, or die um, age must be a number. It's basically a putty error message, right? Um, in which case it's that. Okay. It prints age must be a number. Can't you make the error message default to bad input? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. That's what I did in the previous class, in fact. So, um, yeah, either way, works the same way. So if they don't pass in an error message, if they just call die, then it will print bad input to the screen. If uh, they pass in age must be a number, then it will print that instead. So this is called a default parameter on a function. And it essentially creates two different versions of the function, a one parameter version and a zero parameter version. Okay. Um, for a more standard um, function, like let's make a high pot function, double high pot. HY pot is already taken, so we're gonna use a different one, double X, double Y. So we'll do a Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorem. So we're going to return the square root of the pow of x squared plus the pow of y squared, like that. And so we need to include so right. There we go. All right. So this is going to square x, square y, add them together, and square the result, return the result. So um, that is the high hypotenuse of a triangle, who's a right triangle whose one leg is x, one leg is length y. Okay. And so you can you can have one function call another function, and you can have the results of that function add to the results of another function, and then the results of that get square rooted, and then that gets returned. And then down in main you would call hypot like this hypot three four. And if you see that out, it will output five. All right, three, four, five triangle. Can you go over recursion? Recursion is when a function calls itself. And um, in order to understand recursion, you have to first understand recursion. Okay. So why don't you learn recursion, then I'll teach you recursion. <laughs> No, I, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, 
Yeah, so the uh, 15 minutes left. Yeah, okay, fine. Um, so let's say that you wanted to recursively add up, uh, do the Fibonacci sequence, right? So you do double or int Fibonacci, int x. So the Fibonacci sequence returns uh, if x is less than or equal to 2. The first two elements in the series are 1, otherwise it returns the Fibonacci of x minus 1 plus the Fibonacci of x minus 2. So that would be a recursive function there. Name of the function is fib. Parameter list, it takes one integer as a parameter. It returns an integer. Um, one, thing, one thing you don't want to do, by the way, is this. Um, this is not a compiler error, by the way. If you have a function that says it's going to return a double and you don't return anything, that's, for whatever reason, that's a warning. That's not an error. That's a warning. And it'll probably crash your program if you do it. Um, so make sure that if you promise that you're returning a double, you actually return a double in all cases. Like sometimes you'll have like something like this, and it looks like you're always returning a double, but you're not always. Fortunately, the compiler will warn you. It does not return a value in all control paths. That shouldn't be a warning. That should be an error. That should You should not accept that in your code base because if x is greater than or equal to 100, it just won't return a value at all, and it will, who knows what will happen. Bad things will happen, or not. That's even worse. If it works correctly, it's, it's even worse. Okay, uh, so always make sure, it's like, so if, if you're not sure if all the, you got all these ifs and else and all these things, if you're not sure, 100% sure that it can always return a value, just at the very bottom, just like toss like a return zero at the bottom. You know, just in case, you know. Just in case, or, or, or make it like negative, I don't know, 999, something obvious that something went wrong, you know what I mean? Or throw, right? Throw, throw a runtime error or something, right? Yep. All right, so this is recursion. Um, every recursive algorithm needs to have two things. It needs to have a base condition to stop infinite, infinite looping. And it needs to have an inductive step that moves towards the base. Condition. If you do that and you write the code properly, then you're golden. Okay. Hurts the brain though. Hurts the brain. Best way of getting good at recursion is just to practice it. Okay. Um, opening of chug. <laughs> There is no zeta function on, on Chug. Okay. All right, so that's functions. Uh, let's talk about vectors. So uh, vectors and arrays. So um, when you want to make lots of variables at once. Okay. So there's three options here for vectors and arrays. There is the C style array, which we will title don't use ever simple enough I'm not going to talk about it anymore Thanks. 100 integers and initializing them all to zero array of int 100 r2 um, maybe sometimes use, use. yep uh, So um, if you need stack allocation, stack allocation is smaller, but it's faster. So if you're having a function that's called a lot of times and you got the stack space for it and the thing doesn't need to grow or shrink, an array is good. Otherwise, vectors are the way to go. So we're mostly just going to talk about vectors because that's what we use. So uh, vector dot push back. Add the number 100,000 to the end of it. Add 100,000 to the end of the vector. And grows the vector by one. So that actually increases the size of the vector. Arrays cannot change sizes. Okay. Um, what is Chug? It is a cheater, cheater's website. Uh, vec.popback uh, deletes 
the last element of the vector. If you want to see out the first element in the vector, you can use either vector dot at zero or vector dot front. If you want to output the last element of the vector, you can output vector dot at vector dot size minus one. Ain't nobody got time for that, so instead we output vector dot back. So that is the first print first and last elements. You do dot front dot back to get the front element, last element. Um, 40, 41, 26, 45 is the standard sequence. So 26 next semester for you guys. Okay, so that, uh, if you want to erase a range of things, you can say vector dot erase from vector dot begin plus 10 to vector dot end erases all elements from 10 onwards. If you want to search the array for something, um, find vector dot begin vector dot end for the number 100,000. It won't find it because it's it got deleted. So we're going to search the entire vector for the number 100,000 and this returns a, something resembling a pointer. If that pointer is pointing at the end of the vector, that means not found. Otherwise, you can see out the value. Do you want? Yes, 45 is transferable to Fresno State, and it, can, and it transfers as a junior level class, which is nice. Very few community college classes transfer as junior level classes. Okay, so um, yeah, you can find vectors, you can sort vectors, that's really, really useful. Sort vector.begin, vector.end, that sorts it. Um, yep, yeah. if you want to print everything in, uh, in a vector, pretty easy. Prints everything in the vector. So in general though you use a vector like this. Um, so if you want to set element 10 to be 324 with an array it looks like this. The vector we typically use dot at in this class. You can use square brackets but I, I don't recommend it. Now C++ style arrays also have support also have dot size and dot app. Nice. Okay. So that's one of the reasons why I like C++ arrays better is that they have a dot size. They'll tell you how big they are. They got a dot at so you can do bounds checking on them. They're just better. They're just hundred percent better than a C style array. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I would take game dev maybe after you finish or at concurrently, you can take game dev anytime you want after you take 40. Um, yeah, it's fun. Game development's fun. All right, so that's vectors. And then the last thing to talk about is classes. Um, okay. So a class defines a new type of variable. Okay. A class makes a new type. Variables of that type are called terminology vocab time objects. They're called objects. So struct customer. So let's say we're making a customer relations database. Tracking information about all of our customers. What kinds of things do we need to know? Uh, the, the example I gave in the previous section was we're running a carpet store and we want to track you know, everything that we need to track about our customers. So what kinds of things do you think we should track for our customers? What, what kinds of data describes a customer? Usefully, I don't care about their hair color, or eye color, you know. If I was the DMV, yeah, but I'm a carpet store. Okay, name, maybe first name and last name separately. 
Customer ID. Okay. And ID. Why not? Okay. What else? Balance. Oh, yeah. Do you think it ends good, or do we need to use a uh, <laughs> long, long? Are we going to go over $2 billion? <laughs> so we can have a balance of greater than $2 billion and a negative balance. Yeah, negative balances are possible, right? Uh, reward points, uh, favorite texture. Okay. Yeah, sure. Store membership status, bool member. Anything that's a primitive you should initialize. Strings don't need to be initialized. Favorite color. Um, I, I'm just going to write down favorite. Uh, should it be a class inside of a struct because we want it to be private? Uh, we're reviewing CSI 40. So in this class, in fact, in the next couple weeks, we're going to be learning all about how to do proper class design with private and public and all that stuff. For now, we're just reviewing uh, first semester computer science. And so for that, we're just using what's called plain old data. So this is called uh, pod style design. Plain old data. It's just a bunch of variables living under one roof. An aggregate object, a bundle of variables. I don't know, however you want to describe it. It's just a bunch of variables living together. Okay. Um, structs and classes are the same thing. Um, classes just default to, to private, structs default to public. That's the only difference. And so if you're doing something like this with no constructors, no destructors, structs are the way to go. It's less typing. All right, so uh, let's, let's just leave it at that. And now let's go down into uh, the bottom of the main and let's talk about classes, which is section eight. And let's make a couple customers. So I'm going to paste that there so I don't need to look at it again. Um, so I'm gonna make a customer called Min Corelli and I can set his and Corelli dot first name is equal to justice and his 5s last name is equal to then Corelli or if I wanted to I could use a curly brace initialization and um, do this so the first element is the first name Second element is the last name. Uh, favorite, his favorite carpet is uh, golfing putting green. <laughs> when I recarpeted my uh, my house, they actually had this horrendous, like light pink carpet, and they're like, "We'll give it to you. <laughs> Do you want it? We will give you this carpet if you want it. It's yours for the taking." I'm like, nah, I'm all right. You couldn't pay me to. <laughs> you couldn't pay me to. Take. It was the most horrendous color ever. It was cut. It was comfortable actually, but oh man, it was ugly. They also had putting green. So if you want to install a putting green in your office, the carpet company would actually uh, uh, do that for you. It's kind of cool. Um, I mean, yeah, it kind of would be. You know, if you're into golf, like, why not? You know. Um, so uh, can you forget struct and just stick to class? They're the same thing. They're literally the same thing. Here. There you go. It's a class now. It, it, it's the same thing. It's the same code. So, um, classes default to private, structs default to public. So, yeah. one line, one line different. Uh, is he a member of our store? Of course he is. His ID is one two three, and his balance is one ten thousand. And so this makes a variable named Mincarelli of type customer 
and it sets Min Crelly's first name to be Justice, last name to be Min Crelly. And then if we want to see out this, I can say Min Crelly dot first name. Your order is your order is ready. <laughs> your order is ready. Your order is ready. And so you access um, you access sub variables, which we call member variables. By using using the I'm not typing right the, the dot operator. It's in a weird angle right now. Okay. Uh, so that if we want to if we want to if he gets married, we can say Mincarelli dot last name is equal to Smith or whatever. So basically, all those variables. So when we make Mincarelli. This makes a bunch of variables all at once. It makes a first name, a last name, a favorite, a member, an ID, and a balance all at once. And we can initialize them using curly brace uh, syntax, or we can individually set them like this using the dot operator. So you can say min curly dot last name, min curly dot. As a wedding present, we are going to clear out his balance. Equals zero. There you go. You don't know us anything anymore. So. Uh, it just makes a bunch of variables named mincurly dot first name, mincurly dot last name, mincurly dot favorite, and it's just really nice and clean and orderly to have all these variables kind of clustered together under one name. It's a lot easier to keep track of than if you had all these variables like like mincurly first name, mincurly last name, mincurly favorite. It, it gets very complicated. So instead, we just make one variable named min mincurly, and then we just access the member variables by using dot dot first name, dot favorite, dot ID. And you can read to them, you can read from them, you can write to them, just like any other variable. Okay. So, uh, can't wait to install some lavender scented carpet. It, it, it wasn't lavender scented, it just looked like something that came from like a candy shop or something like that. Like it was, it was horrific. And apparently they'd had it around for like a long time and they just can't find somebody to take it off their hands for them. Uh, classes are safer. There is no difference between a struct and a class. Um, yeah. It was like pink bubblegum. Yeah. Can you imagine carpeting your house in it? Like, I thought about it for a second, but no. Nah, not even for free. <laughs> Customer class needs a bull Karen. You know my daughter's middle name is Karen, right? She was named after my favorite aunt, also named Karen. Yeah, no, it it, it doesn't bother me, but uh, um, yeah, I, I'm never giving my daughter that that hairstyle though. <laughs> I want to talk to your manager. I really like the name Karen. It is a shame. Yeah, I I just can't imagine anyone naming their kids Karen anymore, and it's kind of sad because my aunt was really awesome. She was really she was a really amazing woman, and died at a fairly young age of uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. So, yeah. I actually started playing the violin uh, because she was a fiddler, and so I, I picked it up. I played it a bit when I was a kid, but kind of in her memory, I started playing the violin and the viola. Because of that. Yeah. The damage of memes. Well, it's not even a meme. It's like, um, it was kind of interesting. I was listening to NPR on the term Karen, and, like, there were all these woke people, and uh, this one guy was like, yeah, I hear people named Karen are like complaining that we were using the term derogatively, to which I say, who cares? And I'm like, really? You can do that? You can just say, who cares? That's an allowed option? You're playing with fire there, buddy, you know? Oh, when somebody's offended, you can just be like, who cares? You know, hmm, good to know. Didn't know that was a move that was allowed, you know? So, Chad, I don't think Chad is, yeah. Any parent who still names their daughter Karen is a savage. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, you shouldn't. You shouldn't feel worried. It's like literally, nothing bothers me. You know, it's um, um, it, it's just interesting to me. Like that. Uh, you know, like I said, like like it's a bunch of people discussing like the uh, the the racial history of of, of the term. Like um, they're getting into like. Um, uh, the Miss Becky, you know, in terms like that, from like the antebellum period and stuff like that, and um, 
And I was like, oh, you can just say, oh, I don't care. Who cares? You know, when somebody says, I'm offended, who cares? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. She wanted the task manager. That's amazing. Why did Karen control delete? She wanted the task manager. Yeah. Okay. So that's it. That's two hours of, uh, that is two hours of computer science. That is a summary of everything we learned in CSI 40. It's pretty much a, a summary of everything in the basics of C++. This semester, we're going to continue our journey down the, uh, down the pathway of, uh, of learning C++. We're going to learn more about classes, proper class design. We're going to learn more about containers. Uh, the uh, containers are things like vectors and arrays. Um, there's lots more containers. A container is anything that holds lots of variables. So unordered maps, some of you might have learned last, last semester. We're going to go through stacks and queues and hash tables and binary search trees this semester. So we're going to learn a lot about um, we're going to learn a lot about containers, and uh, we're going to learn about proper class design, and we're also going to learn about the standard library. It's so like this kind of stuff when like you're finding something or erasing something, you could probably write that by hand. Like this isn't hard. You just start at the beginning and go to the end, and yeah, like you could probably do this in a one line range based for loop. But by by learning what's in the standard library you can sort of not repeat work that other people have done. And when you're aware that other people have done stuff like mass erasing from a vector, you don't have to do it yourself. And a lot of times the way they implement it is going to be faster than if you implemented it. Because if you erase from the beginning of a vector, it's very slow. Whereas when they do a block delete, they can actually optimize it and make it much faster. So that's what we got to look forward to this semester. We're going to continue our exploration of C++. I think everybody here learned something new today, right? If you some some corner of C++, something about auto maybe, ternary operator, um, type aliasing. I don't think I've covered that before. Um, uh, this all this stuff probably some of it you've never seen before. Um, go to <laughs> go to. No class on Monday. That's right. There's no class on Monday. Um, you can show up to school. I'm not going to be there. You can show up on Discord. I'm not going to be there. It's been a rough semester so far. I need a three-day vacation. So, you know, good job, everybody. I'm still going to grade FizzBuzz on Monday, though. So have FizzBuzz done by Monday, and then uh, it's, it's this much code. Like, you should have it done already, right? Um, I'm just giving you enough time in case, I don't know, you can't figure out how to log on to the server or something. And then, uh, I know, I'm, I'm tired, I'm exhausted. This has been a really rough semester. I need the, I need the long weekend. <laughs> it's Martin Luther King Day. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. A friend of mine was on Jeopardy, and they didn't give him the question because he said Martin Luther King. And Alex Trebek's like, it's Martin Luther King Jr. And he's like... <laughs> yeah. Fizzbuzz made you need a vacation. I, I sure hope not. If Fizzbuzz is causing you to explodes your brain it's probably a bad sign um you finish it <laughs> amazing uh an unsigned integer 64 yeah that's actually it's actually really useful this isn't this isn't fringe by the way like i said if you do if you do unreal engine programming you will see u32 u64 i30 you know you'll see those all throughout the code because you do not want the system to run you don't want your program to run differently on different systems if you need 32 bits you specify i want 32 bits I want 64 bits, you know, and um, that's how I could. I, I don't want to be unpleasantly surprised when I move systems, you know what I mean? So, uh, Kearney's friend is Ken Jennings. Now, he was just in the department with me at uh, UCSD, and so he went on Jeopardy, and um, he did all right. I don't think he won. Yeah, he did all right. It, it, no, sorry, he, he wasn't in the department with you. He was an electrical engineer. And Alex Trebek uh, was like, so, I understand you do electronics. <laughs> and he's like, well, um, sort of. Because, you know, like, he didn't really want to explain the difference between electrical engineering and electronics. And, uh, and Alex Trebek's like, that's really nice. Like, not a lot of people know how to repair lamps these days. And, like, 
power cords and vacuums and my friend's just dying on the inside. <laughs> it's like, you just see his face it's like, no, I make chips and do electro-optical computing or whatever, you know, <laughs> like, you were a pair of vacuum cleaners. That's so neat. <laughs> Oh, oh goodness. Yeah. Yeah, that was a fun show to watch. That was a fun show to watch. Yeah. Okay. That's really offensive. Uh, calling him electronics. Nah. It's... Yeah, he's, he's an old guy, so, yeah. Yeah, what can you do? Yeah, what can you do? Just tw just tease him when, when he gets back. Hey, can you repair my vacuum for me? I got a... I got a, a battery here that needs swapping out. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, gosh. Yeah. All right. So that's it for today. Enjoy Monday off. Uh, I will collect FizzBuzz at noon on Monday. So make sure it's done by then. Please don't use your last chance on it. Please get it done. And then uh, I'll see you guys on uh, Wednesday. All right. Peace out, everyone. Bye. <laughs> the IT guy. Even worse. Even worse. The power cable report, the repair guy. <laughs>